Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I feel greatly honored to come and talk at this conference, and I wish to thank the organizers for inviting me to come and talk. I'll be talking on Target, on behalf of the Target International Collaborative Group. The reason why we are using intraoperative radiotherapy has been already talked about today. From 1894 to 1995, there appears to be a sea change in the way we treat breast cancer locally. But really, has there been a change in those hundred years? What has really changed is from radical surgery, we have moved to radical radiotherapy. And all the fields that used to be extirpated by William Hofstede are now treated by radical radiotherapy. This was the state in 1995. So the guiding principle of treating the whole breast has remained the same in those hundred years. So as you have heard already, the question, this symposium, and as Professor Veronesi has said, that everybody is asking now, is does the whole breast really need radiotherapy in all patients? Now how did I come to this question? In breast clinics in Bombay, where I used to, I did my residency in, nine, in early 1990s, I had to ask patients who came to the Tata Memorial Hospital in Bombay, can you afford, after giving the diagnosis of breast cancer, can you afford to stay in Bombay for six weeks? If the answer was yes, we would say we can conserve your breast. If you say no, we need to do a mastectomy. That was not a very happy situation to tell a patient. Now this was in the clinic. And as a research fellow, I did some work in the lab in which I did a whole organ analysis of mastectomy specimens, and this will answer some of the questions asked before, in which the new analysis in these patients who would have been otherwise suitable for breast conserving surgery but underwent mastectomy because they couldn't stay in Bombay. And these were analyzed by the standard whole organ analysis method, and I found that 63% of patients harbored occult cancer. This is similar to the data found by Professor Roland Holland. But when analyzed in three dimensions, we found that 80% of these are in other quadrants. So these breasts with small tumors also had tiny invasive and in situ cancers spread all over the breast. This is very similar to what is found in autopsy studies as done in Denmark. So the next step would be that means everybody should have mastectomy and that would be going and ignoring all the available data on breast conserving surgery in which, as we have heard before, 90% of recurrences occur in the index quadrant. This is true whether radiotherapy is given or not given. Therefore, these cancers in other quadrants are probably dormant cancers, just like multiple cancers in thyroid or in prostate, and they probably don't cause local recurrence, but probably give rise to some rate of new primaries as they do in the other breast. So therefore, radiation to the index quadrant alone might be sufficient. And with this study in 1995, I came to work with Professor Michael Baum. And when I said this to him, he said, well, you are in the right place at the right time. We are already looking at a machine which can give radiotherapy in the operation theater to the area around the primary tumor. So we had to take three leaps. One, use a new machine. Two, use a new technique that is giving it in the operation theater. And three, test the new approach of only giving radiotherapy to the index quadrant. As the first step, this is the machine which was developed in 1992 for brain tumors and got approved in 1998 by FDA for radiotherapy. Uses a 12 volt supply and produces 50 kV X-rays. Does it really produce tumoricidal effects? We know radiation causes tumor, uh, kills tumors, but does this particular machine do it? Preclinical experiments with PRS showed that in cell cultures, its radiobiological effect is probably between 1.2 to 2.5. In rat gliosarcoma cells, it has been found that it induces necrotic and apoptotic cell death and rapid cell death through non-apoptotic pathway. In canine experiments, it induces well-demarcated ablation in liver and in kidney. What does it do in humans? We did a very small clinical study in elderly patients diagnosed with breast cancer and who were very frail to undergo any surgery. 
We treated these patients on a MAMO test machine. In this, the patient lies prone on a Fisher MAMO test machine. Computer-aided stereotactic localization is performed. The PRS device, which is photon radio surgery system, is adapted to fit on the MAMO test gantry. So that is the PRS device. That is the bare probe, which is covered by a sterile sheet. And that goes onto the gantry, which is normally used in this machine for fitting the biopsy needle or the mammotome needle. So this is adapted for that. So that is the breast. That's the patient lying on the table, prone, and the breast coming up from below. Real-time localization of the tip of this device is done to be in the center of the tumor. And over 12 minutes, a large dose of radiation is given. So 134 gray physical dose is given to the center, and 23.5 gray is achieved at the margin. The dose that we arrived at here was similar to the dose that would be, that would be given to patients receiving intraoperative radiotherapy as if this tumor was the spherical applicator. In, this, in these patients, the closest skin received 16 gray. We did preoperative MRI scan, which showed a tumor before intravenous gadolinium, enhancing very well, showing high vascularity. Six days after treatment, MRI showed hardly any enhancement. This is just six days. And biopsy showed dying tumor cells. At four weeks, again, there was hardly an enhancement. And the biopsy at that time showed progressive fibrosis, apoptosis, and occluded blood vessels. At three months, there was no enhancement and no palpable tumor. So this device works. The second step now was to do the new technique of intraoperative radiotherapy. So that is the electron generator and accelerator, which accelerates electrons along this 3.2 millimeter tube. They strike the tip and generate x-rays. These are modulated by the spherical applicator to give a uniform dose of radiation to the tissues which are at the highest risk of getting local recurrence after having had a wide local excision of the primary tumor. It takes about 25 minutes to deliver. These are soft x-rays at 50 kV, so there's a small high dose ray region. There's quick attenuation of in, within the tissues, so distance itself protects normal tissues like the heart or the lungs. Shielding is easy and it can be performed in a normal routine operation theater just after the surgery. The dose, physical dose, is about 15.5 gray at 2 millimeters and comes down to 5 gray at 1, one centimeter. So this is how it looks after having had the wide local excision. That is the applicator sphere. That is the applicator shank going inside the tumor bed. There's a small video. That's the wide local excision being performed. That's a skin incision. This is the tumor and the normal breast tissue margin being taken away. This is the mag cavity margin, which you can see the deep muscle. We measure the cavity, choose one of the applicators between 2.5 to 5 centimeters. We take a bursting suture, insert the applicator to make sure there is a close proximity of the breast tissue to the applicator and tie the first string. We place thermoluminescent detectors to measure the skin dose. And we also place a shield over this area to st stop any stray radiation from radiating the anesthetist. Because most all, all the rest of the staff actually goes, leaves the theater for about 20 to 25 minutes and has a cup of coffee. So that's how it looks. That's the machine. And after 25 minutes, we come back, take the applicator out, and close up. So rather than the complicated confirmation of the source to the target, the target, that is the pliable breast tissue, conforms to the source. So what should we call it? In one of the journeys in the British Rail, I thought it could call it targeted intraoperative radiotherapy and call it target. And everybody liked it because target is immediate, it is truly conformal, and is possibly higher radiobiological effect. The UK pilot study started recruitment in July 1998, recruiting early operable breast cancers less than 4 centimeters in size, had wide local excision and axillary surgery, 
followed by boost irradiation with intrabeam, followed by, in most patients, external beam radiotherapy without the boost. These are the updated results of the UK pilot study in which 25 patients were recruited with tumors ranging from 0.42 to 4 centimeters. Now the median follow-up is four and a half years. We have not had any major complications. We had one patient who developed new primary at a site distant from the original tumor, and the cosmetic results are good. I'll go into some detail about that. And revolution, as I, as I thought of this, I made this up in the morning. A revolution is easy if many people have the same idea at the same time. So we had international pilot studies. We had 25 patients in the UK, 57 patients in the US, 27 in Australia, 50 in Germany, and 26 in Italy. So we've had now 185 patients treated in pilot studies. Of these, 163 patients received intrabeam plus external beam, and 22 received intrabeam alone. The median follow-up is 18 months. We have had one patient with a new primary at 42 months, that's a UK patient, and one diffused recurrence at two months in the German cohort. We have had a few complications. One patient had radionecrosis of skin presenting at three months. Three patients had delayed wound healing. Five patients had some skin erythema, and three had wound infection. This happened in the Australian cohort mainly because they were not using in perioperative antibiotic prophylaxis. This patient, who was the third patient, had radionecrosis of skin, presented at three months with this scab, which broke, gave, gave way, but it healed. And at nine months, it looks like this. At 28 months, it looks like this. She is very happy with this result. We have modified the technique, and we have not had the cosmetic result at 49 months is, is very good. In this study, the cosmetics is important, especially because these patients receive a high dose of radiotherapy, high dose rate, and therefore we believe they may be concerned. They, are, they may have more fibrosis. So we had a formal assessment of the UK cohort in which 13 patients were available for assessment using a 12-point score by an independent surgeon and a breast care nurse. And we found, and these details of this are available on the poster being presented tomorrow, that the when we analyzed this, when we did this cosmetic analysis, we asked the patient to use the same scoring system as the surgeon and the nurse. And we recorded these on separately and analyzed them. We found that the patient gave a score of four out of five for breast appearance, and this correlated very well with the score given by the surgeon. So surgeons and nurses were pretty good at assessing what patient felt the appearance was. We also assessed breast texture and softness which scored 3 and 2.9, respectively, and breast comfort, or lack of tenderness, scored 3.5 or 3.4 out of 5 by the surgeon and the nurse. We also asked the patients how satisfied they were with each of these parameters. For calculating an index, we asked them what is the actual score out of 10 for each of these parameters, and divided that by the expected score. So if the answer was one, that means patient was satisfied. So at three and a half years, the satisfaction index for appearance, texture, and comfort was all 1.3 with a median of one with those confidence intervals. So patients at least were happy. So in conclusion of the pilot studies, we say that target is feasible, it is safe, and it does indeed give a satisfactory cosmetic result even after adding external beam radiotherapy. So the third step is to the new approach of index quadrant radiation in which patient breast cancer suitable for breast conserving surgery are randomized into two strategies. This is not intraoperative versus external beam, but intraoperative radiotherapy in all patients followed by if these patients are deemed to be high risk of elsewhere recurrence then they would receive external beam radiotherapy. And we expect this number to be about 15%. Now, each center taking part in the trial at the outset chooses what these high-risk criteria are. And they may be patients less than 65 years or less than 50 years are excluded. Patients with grade 3, ER negative, more than 2 centimeters, could be excluded by individual centers. 
or not, depending upon their level of uncertainty and the local culture. The control arm gets the standard breast conserving therapy. Randomization at the University College London began in March 2000. We need 2,232 patients in total. The numbers and the power calculations are very similar to of, as shown by Dr. Frank Vicini. The trial design is pragmatic and it is open to participation. Several centers in the US, Europe and Australia have already got the machine and, have, and as you said have piloted the patients and several other centers are commissioning their machines and submitting protocols for IRB. So I'm very hopeful. The potential clinical impact of target in terms of local recurrence in patients with high risk of local recurrence, it may be better than a standard boost. And in patients with low risk of local recurrence, it may replace the post-operative radiotherapy. Worldwide, therefore, it could save thousands of women from choosing mastectomy and losing their breast. This is new technology which actually will cost less money. So it could save, for example, in the UK, about 15 million pounds per year if we expect 60% of patients to have breast conserving surgery. So the dream is, from radical mastectomy, we move to breast conserving surgery, from axillary node dissection as we are moving to sentinel node biopsy, and from whole breast radiotherapy to intraoperative radiotherapy, either with electrons, wires, balloon, target, or 3D conformal radiotherapy. I hope that works out. I wish to thank all the investigators and colleagues from University College London, from Sir Charles Gardner Hospital in Australia, Institute of Radiology in Radiotherapy in Mannheim, from New York Medical Center in New York, and from Aviano in Italy. Thank you. How do you approach the patient who had uh, a positive margin? that you found after you had given intraoperative radiation? We have randomized about 90 patients and in the postoperative arm, we had two patients with positive margins and in the intraoperative, we had one patient. Per protocol, patients with positive margins would get re-excision of the margin. And because these patients would be deemed to be at higher risk of local recurrence, if they receive postoperative, they would receive postoperative as usual, and if they have received intraoperative, they would receive post external beam radiotherapy to the whole breast as well. We felt that that is the safest option. Other questions? The left. Uh, congratulations on your nice study. I am just worried about one thing. Uh, as the local area gets high radiation, whereas the rest of the breast may be subjected to low-dose radiation. We know that low-dose radiation, look at the Hodgkin's data, may create later on a carcinogenesis of the breast. How can we be sure that this won't happen in the long time? We don't know. We'll wait to find out. Uh, Wendy Taylor from the UK. I'm slightly surprised by your study design in that you would imagine that patients just getting local radiotherapy would need a higher dose than patients who also get whole breast irradiation, and yet presumably you're giving the same dose to, to the patients who just get the intraoperative and those you later decide to have whole breast irradiation. That is true. Um, we gave a lot of thought about how much dose we can give in one sitting and the limit that we had given was five gray at one centimeter. And in the pilot study, we tested the worst case scenario in which they also received external beam. And we were, I think, at the border of getting toxicity. So we feel probably five gray at one centimeter is enough to take local control. And in those with a higher risk would get a higher dose without causing too much toxicity. But that does seem to be quite a, a much lower dose than all the other studies we heard about today. That is true. That is true. We are aware of that. Uh, same microphone. Henry Cure, MD Anderson Cancer Center. That was a beautiful talk. As you know, we've been interested in this at NB Anderson, watching your work over the last three or four years. 
we brought this up at our multidisciplinary conferences and actually had the company out to talk about it and look at some of the dosimetry. And our radiation oncologists were concerned that the biologic effective dose or, um, was only going two or three millimeters from the surface of the lumpectomy cavity. So they were concerned that we might be undertreating these patients. Can you address that concern, please? We will know the answer to that question once we have follow-up for these patients. We don't really, once the tumor has been removed, what we are treating is a potential residual tumor. So therefore, a tumoricidal dose may not really be required. And we cannot know the answer to that until we do the experiment. And we know now from all trials that by this, we are really not jeopardizing anybody's life. Right microphone. Uh, Vogel, New York. Pardon me, I'm naive. Uh, it sounds you have a 12 volt source, 50 kV electrons. This ought to be cheap. It is. Is it cheap? How much does the machine cost? How much are the disposables cost? It, in it, current pounds? It, it is cheap in terms of compared to any other type of uh, Linux or radiotherapy equipment. I don't, I can't, I don't know the exact amount. It keeps changing. <laughs> it, is, it is to be given at a reduced cost, I'm told, to centers taking part in the randomized trial. <laughs> <laughs> the back microphone. Baral, Winnipeg, Canada. The question is for you and, and for Dr. Vicini, because those are important initiatives, and I'm delighted to see in what detailed and methodical way we are approaching it. In radiation oncology with dose prescription and the volume is, is of cardinal importance. Now, how do we view this in the context of Dr. Veronese's data showing that quadrantectomy and radiation was superior to lumpectomy? and radiation, given the volume which Dr. Vicini has showed us and the, what you have showed us in your slides. It is, it is possible that if we remove a large part of the breast and give radio, radiotherapy, we would have a local, lower local recurrence rate. But that would be at the cost of cosmetic outcome, I suppose. So removing a smaller tumor would give a much better cosmetic outcome without jeopardizing patient survival. Last question. Yeah, hey, Breck, Boston, uh, beautiful presentation. Um, just to uh, put some uh, ease uh, for some of the concerns about carcinogenesis, uh, so far there have been very little data showing any risk of carci radiation carcinogenesis in women over age 45, and so I imagine that uh, there will be very few patients really at risk for that. But I had a question about patient selection. Uh, clearly, in uh, Frank's study and many of the other uh, implant studies, the, the patients are very highly selected with wide margins, uh, over two millimeters or uh, over five millimeters even. Uh, what are the selection criteria for uh, the target trial? The selection criteria for the target trial are extremely pragmatic, and each center can decide to have only tumors less than two centimeters or decide that every patient who is suitable for breast conserving surgery will go on the trial. So we are going to have subsets of patients who would be randomized in this manner, and we would be able to see if there is really any difference. Yeah, because I think that one of the things we'll discover over time is whether the heterogeneity of tumor types, margin widths, and so on, really have an impact on the outcome. And uh, I would uh, argue that there may in fact, uh, well, there is in fact a survival difference uh, that you see if you have inadequate local tumor control. Um, uh, certainly this is not the same as giving no radiotherapy, but how close it will come uh, in some patients, we'll have to wait and see. Yes. Thank yes. you. Very true. Thank you very much. Thank you.